Welcome to Group Chat. I am Justin Verrier and joining me, Rob Mahoney, Big Waz. Totally normal day to be doing a podcast, but the one thing I think that will bring us all together, both this country and us on this show, is talking about whether or not the Brooklyn Nets are okay. Isn't that right, Rob? America's team? Can we all all rally behind them? I believe. I don't, but we're going to get into that, I'm sure, in this pod. Like, what? What do you envision as the overall gimmick today, Justin? Uh, It is a classic one. It is, believe it or not, one that we've done now at least three years in a row. It's a little Mm. bit different than real or not real, specifically because we're using different terminology. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So we have on the docket, what, five, six different things we're going to talk about early season results, whether or not we believe in those things, whether or not they can persist throughout the rest of the regular season. So item number one, American democracy. Go. (laughs) Big believe. Believe. Big believe. I mean, the people spoke, y'all. You that's that's just what it comes down to. (laughs) If you believe in democracy, you believe in the voice of the people, man. Come on now. We gotta believe in it when we like it and when we don't like it. That's that's a noble message, and I regret the prompt already. Let's let's just go. All right. Why don't we just get into it here? Uh Let's start with, I think, the biggest story in the NBA right now, and that's the Golden State Warriors. I have two things for you here. Two believe it or nots. Can you believe that? Uh, we got Buddy Hield first and foremost, shooting 50.7% from three-point land at extreme volume. We're talking nine a game at this point. He looks like a mini Steph Curry out there. We'll talk about that. Uh, number two, Rob, it's the Warriors defense. Number two in the NBA. We talked very long about OKC and last pod with Kirk Goldsberry. Uh, the Warriors have been pretty damn good in their own right so which of those two things buddy or the warriors defense do you believe in the most going forward from this point on man it's tough because on the one hand buddy has always been streaky he's always been able to catch fire for these stretches and so i am inclined to not believe in him but buddy within this offense i do Mm -hmm. kind of believe with so if i can dag a little bit i kind of believe both of these things is that allowed so much hope. Is it allowed? Yeah. Is it allowed to have that much hope today? <laughs> Absol- absolutely, it is, and especially because to me, Golden State's defense is what I'm going to believe and choose to believe in more. And it's because they have Draymond Green, right? Yeah. Um, it's not just that Draymond is one of the probably five best defenders of my life. Um, all time I'm talking about here uh, is that the defensive talent is there. Like Wiggins has looked, you know, pre-back injury or whatever, has looked spring as springy as he's looked since 2022. I thought he had his moments, especially on defense last night, where he looked pretty nice. Uh, Gary Payton the second. Second. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, also, <laughs> also looks as springy as he has since 2002. And... You know, the Warriors have a collective defensive IQ that I think makes their defense real. So when you have buy-in, effort, talent, and an an IQ where, like, especially in the first half where they were mixing up coverages, you know, depending upon personnel to me, which is, like, the hallmark of a real bona fide defense is, like, we play – Jason Tatum pick and rolls differently than we do Pritchard and we do it differently depending on who's handling it and who's setting the screen and who's the defender on who like the fact that they can make these calculations instantly then they're like all right we're gonna ball pressure Derek White here we're gonna ball pressure Pritchard here we're gonna lay back on Tatum a little bit here try to go them into two point shots like it's hyper high level stuff and so the defense to me is the realest part. Yeah, I believe in it being better. I guess the question is, how much better will it be this season? Two feels like a stretch. That we as yeah. we kind of addressed. Two is crazy. Yeah, their their schedule up until now has been pretty charming. But last night against the Celtics was a big old test. They didn't have Jalen Brown in that game. Obviously, Porzingis wasn't in there for the Celtics. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, They do have aggressive perimeter defenders in a way that they haven't before. Wiggins and and Gary Payton and Draymond. And I I think the one thing that I'm curious about, and Rob, I'm curious how you think about this, is it seems like they're getting a lot from that starting unit playing Draymond Green with Trace Jackson Davis together. That seems to be a pretty formidable front court defense. I do wonder if that the trade-off on offense so far has worked in their favor. I wonder if that's long-term viable because you're giving up shooting. Uh, Draymond is shooting way above his head. Yet again, this is two straight seasons, but I'm I'm not so sure that they'll get enough offense in order to keep that defensive group together. 
Yeah, there could be some issues there, but that's where having Steph back is such a huge deal. And I think where the proof of concept while Steph was out was a huge deal, right? Showing that this team can win games with defense basically alone plus depth goes a long way in terms of figuring out like how we're going to manage the season overall. If you can get through it with everyone being fresher, Draymond being fresher, Steph being fresher as a result of running 12 and 13 guys deep as Steve Kerr is, I I would imagine just over the moon to do. Like this is how he would love to play. (laughs) The Warriors roster has not always allowed for it, but the Kumbaya vibes are as strong as they've ever been. The depth is genuinely impressive and incredible. And to get that much depth in a way that is like factoring into this defense we're talking about, this is not three core defenders like papering over everyone else's deficiencies like buddy healed is getting up and into people and that's how you know there's some special sauce there well was i think that's why i'm bullish on buddy because it seems mm-hmm. like as we've been saying since the offseason practically they went out and got guys that fit the system in a way mm-hmm. that makes so much sense and to me buddy yeah, maybe his shot will come and go as it typically does. Maybe he'll settle in around 40%. He still is, we should mention, one of the best three-point shooters in recent history. It's like Steph Clay and Buddy Heald. So this isn't a total surprise. He just seems to fit the flow and the energy that Steve Kerr wants. So uh, are you surprised that he's had such success this early? Not really, um, because what, what shooters tend to find when they play next to Steph Curry is that it's nice. It's nice when the defense um, has to be paying attention to all his off-ball stuff, and it's harder to guard somebody else who's doing the off-ball movement. Now, like, he's not going to be as good as prime Clay on offense. We know that. But can he be like the Urkel to Clay Stefan Arkell? <laughs> I think so. I-, I think he can be that close in resemblance and and facsimile to to what Clay does, and you know what I like already is that Buddy's not gonna do a lot of the dribble like off of a pick and roll and <laughs> shoot into a three. That's not what he's gonna do. But like man, if it gets kicked out to him, the one dribble, side dribble, back dribble, just one dribble shoot, he's good. And just firing off of a screen, which he did a yeah. lot of, particularly last night, like he has that. And so I think he's well equipped to be you know, a nice clay uh, sort of hologram, you know, if not the real thing. He's one of these players who's always been a bit tough to place because if you put him in a pure role player capacity, like the Sixers did last season, he will occasionally pop off for a big game. But when he's not getting the ball, when it's not swinging his way, because, for example, that's just like not what the defense is dictating. He's kind of useless out there in some of those matchups. But when you get him moving and involve him heavily in, if not the overall offense, at least a second unit, you know, select lineups when Steph's out there or not, then all of a sudden you're drafting off of a, a momentum that's more than just makes and misses, right? It's the attention he draws. And that's something that Golden State knows how to play off of as well as any team in the league. And so, yeah, you're getting some of this like sp- Splash Brothers energy. I know there's some uh, alternative nicknames in the works. We'll see which one ends up sticking. But look, he showed up with the 23 and me. He said, biologically, I am a Splash Brother. I am ready to be a part of this. And he's been delivering. And the fact that the father, yeah, I guess (laughs) the fact fact that Draymond as the secondary ball handler has been doing this exact thing for 10 years now, (laughs) like it's been 10 years of this. Yeah. Like, I, I think that matters as well. It's like Draymond looking for this guy, you know, rescreening. It, on the break when Draymond gets a rebound and he's spraying out to shooters on on fast breaks, like all of that stuff is going to aid in making Buddy a big part of this offense. And it's early in the season too, so teams don't have this stuff perfectly scouted um, as of yet. And so, yeah, um, he's gotten some nice success from it. So I yeah, don't we- believe that the Warriors will be the second best defense, and I don't believe mm-hmm. that Buddy will be quite this hot all the time. But I do believe that they're going to be a defense first team this year. And I do believe that Buddy is going to be incredibly focal to how they survive on offense. Yeah, I was with Buddy when he was a rookie for the half season with the Pelicans. And he was narrowly forced into that standstill 3 and D role that a lot of players around that time typically just instantly were thrust upon. And... It was played for laughs when the Kings uh, traded for him. And then Vivek was talking about him being like a Steph type. But I think history has kind of shown that he is at the very least a Steph type, not necessarily the next Steph Curry. And to that point, the numbers between he and Steph, as we record this today, are eerily similar. Buddy is averaging 21.1 points. Steph is averaging 21.2. 
Buddy is averaging 14.5 field goals as attempt and 9.1 threes per game. Steph is averaging 14.6 field goals attempts and nine threes per game. Like it, it is kind of like the the main band and then the cover band playing alongside each other. And it just seems like it over, <laughs> why, it doesn't Why overlap. would you ever do that? Why would you ever do a show where the cover band is playing with the main band? Maybe you're just so into that style. Like if it's sublime and bad fish, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're just like well. really deep into one, one style and the war is pretty much are an outlier in terms of style. Uh, I'm really torturing this metaphor, but well, I'm really trying here. <laughs> one one would argue that the current version of Sublime is already a cover band, but we digress. W with Rome, yeah, that's true. That's a good it's point. It's tough. Well, not only is Buddy the person who's kind of following after Steph or channeling his inner Steph in some ways, uh, are we prepared for the Kyle Anderson Splash Brother experience, which apparently is ongoing and happening right in front of our eyes? I, I, I did not know what to make of him suddenly becoming a three-point bomber against the Celtics, but here we are. This is where we live now. Yeah, I think Mike Brain mentioned that he was three of his last 14 to start the season. <laughs> And and so, yeah, I think that was just a sort of regression closer to the mean there um, in the opposite direction for him finally making some threes. But I love that Kyle Anderson is already a, a Kerr, you know, oh, acolyte. Yeah. Like, he's just so plug and play to everything Steve Kerr's about. And, and, and that was nice, nicely on display last night, too. And against Boston, man, who's, like, down two of their best players and it doesn't even matter, like... The, the offense still, especially in the second half when they made some sort of spacing adjustments, still looked like a goddamn machine. It, it, you know, that was a good win by the Warriors. Absolutely. Yeah. And we should also talk about the depth element with the Warriors. I mean, it's just kind of a thing happening across the league, but the Warriors probably represent it best. And I thought it was an interesting contrast to the depth that the Celtics have because the Celtics have just pretty typical good depth. Like Peyton Pritchard mm -hmm. comes out of nowhere, can't miss a shot. Luke Cornett, for all we say about him, is just a credible guy who could play 10 solid minutes if you need him to do it. Kata was very good for the Celtics last night. Just another guy. They have typical championship medal depth. Right. The Warriors go beyond that, where it seems like everybody is on an average to above le average level. And when you're trading off players like Kaminga for, for a Wiggins, there isn't really much of a fall off. And it wasn't much of a surprise then that the Warriors kind of blitzed the Celtics in that second quarter and took control of the game because their second wave and and honestly beyond that into their second and a half wave because they're playing 12 guys in some of these games is so much better than the other team. It does help. And not only is it giving them more credible players against some of these bench players, but I also think it's saving Steph in ways that is advantageous to Steph. It seemed like he was kind of doing a LeBron thing last night where he paced himself out throughout the game was more of a playmaker. He had seven assists, I think in that game, excuse me, he had nine assists in that game. Um, and it just seemed like he waited until the end to pop. And he did have kind of, that takeover moment, or at least he wanted to have that moment. And I do think that's beneficial to him at his age in order to have other guys around him to do more. Yeah, it's just you, what you have to do with your 36-year-old superstar was. Like, you, you got to pace him out like that. You can't have Steph come out here and run a Trey Young level amount of pick and rolls for 82 games. Like, that's, that, that is just, that's death. Um, and so, yeah, this is the smartest way to do it is just, just to be judicious about Steph, you know, sort of manhandling the offense at every single turn and, and pick your spots with it. That's good. Yeah. And they weren't doing that last year. And it seemed like based on what they were trying to do over the offseason, roll players into a Paul George or a Laurie Markin, and they weren't going to do it this year. And maybe they will at some point. I do think the Warriors will hit a, uh, their head on a ceiling and they'll need star power, especially as we get into the playoffs. I think the difference between regular season and playoff basketball is going to be pretty jarring where a lot of these deep teams get into a playoff series with like the Thunder, for instance, and they just have like a big three in the way that the Warriors don't. Um but for now, it's working for them. And I think just having Steph around this recent minor injury be damned, like I, I think it is going to matter and it's going to help them pile wins, which seems to be more important than ever in the NBA. Yeah, 7-1, best record in the West, or at least tied for it, just beat the Celtics with this minute load. This is a resounding success for the Warriors early season. And like I'm I'm honestly a little stunned that it's worked this well, that these guys have fallen into place so quickly. But some of it, as we said, have been the new additions that they brought to bolster the bench. And some of it is getting, you know, Gary Payton II back into form, like Waz mentioned, Kevon Looney playing at this level again, back into form. Like the the resurgence among the existing Warriors and how quickly the new guys have acclimated, I think have just made for a, a really beautiful medley out there.
Yeah. And as we said before, the new guys are playing warrior style of basketball. One of the big parts of that is just pushing the math on the three point volume. Uh, they didn't last night. They only took 34 threes against the Celtics. So credit for them for winning that without having to, to go bombs away. But they are one of the teams in the NBA right now that's really pushing it in that regard. 41 three pointers a game at this point, which would have been among the best in the league last year. But now we live in a league was where the Celtics are regularly taking over 53s a game, 51.2. Uh, th- this is the most three-point attempts we've seen uh, based on league average in NBA history, 37 a game. Kevin Pellin had a stat the other day. Uh, 42% after two weeks of basketball of the shot attempts had been threes. That's over the previous mark of 40% a couple of years ago. Um let me ask you this, Waz. Do you do you like this? Do you like that people are pushing the volume this aggressively? I think there's definitely um, a sort of diminishing returns when it comes to the volume of three-pointers. Like, I get it. The math is math, blah, 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 blah. It's almost like running backs in football where it's like, I'm sorry, I really enjoyed watching Emmitt Smith and Barry Sanders. I don't give a damn if it's more efficient to pass the football. Like, for me, like, I, I do enjoy watching guys put it on the deck and try to score um, more so than, you know, swing, swing to an open three, right? But, I re- like, it's not just that teams are doing it. I think the individual players, like the Shays, like the Ant Edwards, realizing, like, yo, man, like, it's going to be beneficial for me and my team um, to be taking more threes. I think that's where I notice it more because these are guys who are constantly downhill threats, yeah. right? Um, if, you know, when C.J. McCollum finally started shooting threes, it was like, all right, he's just switching the mid-ranger to a freaking three-pointer. That's different than Shea and Ant doing it. And that's where I think I buck up against it, where it feels like, you know, aesthetically what I'm watching from these guys, there's a change and a difference. And so, yeah, I'm not crazy about it, but I'm not sure how we legislate this thing out, which I also think is related to, you know, we were complaining about the 140-point games and all that. They're freaking back, y'all. Um, I, I want us to go back to the knock them out, drag them out from last January and February. I was loving it. Let's get back to that. Less threes, more slobber knockers. Um, get off my lawn. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. If you want to find the solution to addressing, I think, some of the overall like stylistic flattening that's happening right now, where a lot of teams are playing this driving kick style. They are doing swing, swing into threes. I think a lot of that starts with allowing more physicality, with getting us back to that playoff standard where you can actually slow down the drive to begin with and well, then jam that? up the offense. Wasn't that the whole second half of last season where That's we wanted saying. to add more I, physicality? I thought Bring it worked it beautifully, and now Bring we're back. back. Like, like we're we're officiating at the beginning of last regular yeah. season standards, as far as I can tell. Like that's OKC what the Denver feels last like. night was was uh, God. Let's get those memos get those out fouls. then. It's, it worked so well the first time. <laughs> I know the points of emphasis always go off with that hitch, as we know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would love to see a little bit more defensive physicality allowed. Me personally, like I'm not super bothered by it. To me, like a a pick and roll or an ISO into a three is about as good as a pick and roll or an ISO into an 18 foot jumper. Like I don't see a lot of tangible difference stylistically for me. And I think it's easy for us to dwell on it because it's easy to zero in on like in in terms of quantity, like you could look at the box score and say, Oh my God, Anthony Edwards took 15 threes. That's fucking insane. And no one looked at the box score and said, Oh my God, T-Mac took 15 pull up mid range jumpers. There's a crisis, right? There's still a lot of downhill action. The post game is evaporating, as we know. There's not a lot of room for like really good. I, I, let me walk that back. There's room for great post up players. There's not a lot of room for mediocre post up players. Mm-hmm. And because of that, if you don't have great post up talent, you end up in this sort of driving kick style. I can I can see that. I'm just not super. I'm, I'm not super stressed about it. There's it's it's still a driving game. Like Shea is still driving, still yeah. basically leading the league in drives. Right? He's still going to the basket. He's just also shooting some threes. Yeah. The other part of this is like, I get that homogeny isn't attractive when you're seeing the same style replicated across the league. You want to have different teams with different aspects, like even like a different home crowd or like a different environment to play. And that's fun. And it gives variety to the more general NBA fan as opposed to the one team fan. Um, But 
didn't we have that a different way previously? It's like when teams are physical and big, everyone just got physical and big. And I would rather have this where even like the make or miss of a three is more dramatic than someone just like powering down low, back, back, back. And then, you know, just trying to to do it off the glass. So like the three to me is actually a more dramatic, interesting shot than what we had before. And so if this is the homogeny now, I actually don't mind it as much as I did previously when people were playing basically American gladiators out there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, for me, sometimes it feels like guys are just like, might as well just be at a ball rack firing up threes. It like, does feel that way sometimes. just watching sometimes, a guy yeah. just take jump shots. Um, and I think part of it too... And maybe this is my own bias. I don't know if the average fan feels this way. Like, I, I do still feel differently when I watch Derek White take a three than when I watch Chet or, you know, Big Al Horford take a three. When, when the anti when the big Al, man bias? Yeah, like <laughs> a big man taking three still gets on my nerves. Like, wow. get your big ass down there <laughs> and, and do something on the block. Like, I think that's part of my own bias, too. It's like who the three pointers are coming from. And that goes from player to player, team to team. And I shouldn't even say Big Al. Like, when the Celtics generate a three, like, because I know it's what the entire point of their offense is, like, I feel like, all right, well, that was the, the desired outcome. This is a team playing, like, imposing their will on the game right. when they get a three-pointer up. Whereas for other teams, it can feel like they're literally settling. And that feels cheap. You know, um, and, and maybe, again, that's my own bias about how I feel about the way the Celtics run their thing as opposed to everybody feeling sort of copycat-ish. Um, but, yeah, I would personally like to see the threes come down, 100%. There is something where the entire flow of the game seems to be pointing to a 34% three-point shooter, yeah. like role player taking a shot that feels a little bit unsatisfying. And I think that's what people are missing when they talk about the three point as, as you know, as it relates to the diversity of the offenses in earlier eras is like they miss an era where the best players could dominate the ball a little bit more, honestly, not in a Luca James Harden kind of way per se, but in a way where they have more control over the flow of the offense and they're able to dict terms, dictate terms in a different way. And when you lose that and some of that, some of that you've lost because of the rules and the way the rules have evolved. Some of some of that you lost because of the way defenses have changed and the way they can zone up and like basically force the ball out of certain stars hands at this point. It does lead to a different kind of game. And I I'm sympathetic to this perspective in this way. Like we have crossed a pretty crazy threshold, particularly with the Celtics, where they are taking now more than half of their shots from three. <laughs> I didn't think we were ever going to see that. Like, we've been kind of bouncing around the mid-40s, high-40s. Like Honestly, over the last four years or so, the three-point rate's been pretty flat, like fluctuating a little bit, but pretty consistent. Now we're entering into a slightly different territory with the Celtics specifically, but they also have the roster that's built for it and a roster that's very hard to replicate on a, on a league-wide level. Yeah, I do think part of this little boomlet that we're experiencing to start the season is a lot of teams trying to take cues from the Celtics. Know that the Celtics are going to push the math in the way that every team has to catch up to it. That's why it's not just the Celtics right now. As I'm looking at this, nine teams, if we're rounding up, there's a lot of 39 and a half sort of teams. There's at least nine teams taking around 40 or more threes a game. Like That's a, basically a third of the league at this point. And so I do think it is typical copycat. And also like at a certain point, like you can't win on the highest level if you're not competing against a team like the Celtics. And so they're going to push it that way. I also think, Rob, your point about depth and like the role players doing a lot of this is, is incredibly key because it seems like to be a role player in the NBA now, it's not like you're an you're, there are a lot of specialists out there. You're not just a rebounder anymore. You have a three to go with it. If you're going to be on a bench, it is to your benefit to try to be a three-point shooter just because the mathematical advantage is so strong. And so I think it, all these benches are full of three-point shooters at this point to the point where it's like there's like two to three creators on a team like the, the Mavs prime example where it's like Kyrie, Luca, and then Spencer did what he kind of does it. And the rest of the team is just three and D guys and shooters. And so like we're just stockpiling with the same type of guys. And as a result, we're seeing like a lot of threes and a lot of points. I actually think this is the way to think about it. Like you brought up it as a as a skill in conjunction with something like rebounding, for example. We've just reached a level where there's a minimum threshold for three point attempts for a team. Basically, I I don't know if there's like a hard number, but it's more I guess percentage of the overall offense. If you don't attempt a certain number of threes, you're probably just going to lose. In the same way 
that if you don't have enough rebounding on your team, you're just going to lose. Like we've been thinking about it as this discrete skill that only certain players can do for the vast majority of basketball history. We are in an era now where everyone needs to kind of be able to do it. And maybe there's one big on the floor at a time who can't, but if you're not that guy, you got to be able to shoot just like you have to be able to rebound, just like you have to be able to defend, just like you have to be able to put the ball on the floor now and again. Like it's just part of the overall picture now. Yeah, and for me, again, I I think a lot of this is off of vibes. Um, When I watch the Nuggets, who can barely... And they're trying their darndest, by the way. Um, Some of these Strother shots, I'm like, boy, they coaching them up to shoot the threes. But, like, when I watch the Nuggets go through their regular offense, I don't get itchy thinking, oh, God, a three hasn't gone up in four possessions. What the hell? Like, it doesn't feel like that. It just feels like a team is going through the motions of how they want to attack a defense. Whereas, you know, when when a team misses four brick threes in a row, it's just like, my God, please yeah. put it on the deck. Put your head down. Sack up. Get fouled. Let's go. <laughs> but do you, if we're, we're answering kind of the overarching question, are we believing this? Do we think like these sorts of extreme rates are going to continue, Rob, throughout the season? Or are we going to see sort of a natural falling off to where it's like maybe the Celtics and two other teams are pushing it, but it's really just kind of an outlier sort of set? Yeah, they generally don't hold up like yeah. these sorts of early mm-hmm. season trends do fade a bit over time and teams will get in as they just get into the flow of their seasons. They're going to find other means of offense. I buy that the three point rate overall is going to be up a little bit. And I buy that people are feeling this like this is a real source of angst, I think, in the, in the basketball community right now, as far as what what the soul of the game is and should be. And no one can tell you oh, you're wrong for feeling bored watching threes. Like, if you're bored, you're bored. And that's a problem for the league, whether it's true for me or Justin or anybody else or not. Like, it doesn't really matter if individual people are okay watching this style of basketball, if enough people are turned off by it. That's something that the NBA kind of has to address. Feel your basketball feelings is what Rob is saying. (laughs) Embrace them. We're a feelings forward podcast. That's right. Well, one of the teams that's pushing the math right now uh, are the Brooklyn Nets. They're putting up 40.1 a game. Uh, They're also playing pretty goddamn well. Uh, They're four and four (laughs) at this point. They are currently fourth in the Eastern Conference. And now they are 500. Yeah. Oh, actually, they're tied for third. I didn't even notice that the the (laughs) Pacers are four for four as well. So the Eastern Conference, let's just say first and foremost, has two teams with winning records at this point. Two. Two teams, just absolute dog shit of a conference. And thus the Nets currently stand in fourth. The Pacers are in third. But as I mentioned, they're both 500. That means four teams, 500 or better in the Eastern Conference. But Rob, I would say the Nets have been feisty in a way that is very noticeable. I watch a lot of these games. They've kind of become my new Hawks who were my new Bulls. So I I, I assume that they're just going to completely fall wow. off the place of the earth after we talk about them. Um, but the Nets are way more competent than I ever imagined. And I think it's more shocking that they're competent offensively with the Mm -hmm. personnel that they have. Like they have some good individual scores. They have a lot of role players we really like. But if you were to tell me, surprise, the Brooklyn Nets are four and four, eight games into the season, I would say, oh, well, clearly they're like flying around defensively. They're making it work. They're playing with a ton of energy, which is true. But really, they're leading with their offense first. And they're doing it in a way that is collaborative in that way, but also like there's no way around it draws on specifically Cam Thomas and Dennis Schroeder. Like those guys are buoy scores in a way I did not anticipate. And also this team, even when they go off the floor, is just like figuring it out. This is, this is a great team to talk about in the three point conversation because they do attempt a lot of threes, but they have a clear downhill momentum to everything that they do. It's a lot of high pick and roll offense for those two core guys. It's a lot of spraying out to these shooters. Sure. But they have a pretty good balance right now between actually taking those shots and then just gunning it toward the rim, right? Like these these wings are slashing in in a way that I think is really healthy for the way that the Nets want to play and healthy for the way that any kind of Celtics adjacent team wants to play. And for me, it keeps it pretty interesting. It keeps it pretty fun. Like I like watching these guys try to make make moves off the dribble. And right now they're really walking that balance really well. Yeah, they're playing with pride. Uh, Pretty much everybody assumed that they would stink to start the season, I'd be shocked if their coaches didn't express that to them. Like every team that you walk into their gym looks at you as inferior and that they're going to roll you. And, you know, they've beaten Memphis twice. They've beaten the Bucks. 
They lost an OT to the damn Nuggets. That was like a dog fight. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're playing with pride. And look, man, I love Dennis Schroeder. Um, I'd love to see him get to an actual contender. I think he has like good playoff minutes. Well, he's on still. the third best team in the Eastern Conference, was right. <laughs> <laughs> tied for third. Uh, Excuse me. Sorry, tied. <laughs> I think he has good playoff minutes still left um in the tank, but I don't know that this is going to last. So this is indicative of a team that's gonna be like fighting for anything meaningful over the course of the actual season. But so beating Memphis twice is crazy still. Yeah. You're still. a big old not is what you're saying. No, not believe. Not. Ripley's <laughs> believe it or not, I do not believe. Yeah. <laughs> Can we believe that they are feistier than anticipated, yes. but, also not, but also not? Like, I, they're not going to be a playoff team. This is a fun-ass team. Like, they make yeah. things competitive in ways that you weren't expecting. And those are kind of the best teams. And listen, if you're a Nets fan, there's a few of you still out there, I'm sure. The one thing <laughs> you haven't had is just, like, a breezy, competitive environment. And they have that up and down the roster. I don't think it's a surprise that they're playing this well. Or, well, it's, it is a surprise. It but is I a guess, surprise. It's I guess definitely not, a surprise. If you watch the games, I, I'm not surprised based on the process that they take, where it's like mm. a lot of teams still figuring things out. The Nets have a very clear approach where, as you mentioned, Rob, it is downhill, spray to shooters, and we're just going to be long on defense. I do feel like the the where they are in the standings on offense and defense will flip-flop at some point because to me, this team seems like it's geared to be a pretty credible defense considering how long and athletic they are at virtually every position on the court at this point. Have I been sending text messages about Noah Clowney and how good he's looked thus far? You're goddamn right I have. But in particular, I've been talking about like a Claxton, Clowney, Zaire, Williams lineup where these guys look like they're like have seven, five wingspans, all of them. And now they might weigh a hundred pounds between the three of them. And so they could get pushed around by a Nuggets team, by like a Lakers team down the road. But like, I see it. Like they picked the right guys. The Nets do. They always have. They did before they they went the superstar route. And so it's not surprising, I guess, that they're finding little guys and bringing more out of them because this is what they always did well in the Sean Marks era. Yeah, they have a lot of NBA talent. There were the guys yes. we knew and the guys we had already talked about. There's also just like like Jalen Wilson looks like he can really play. And I know he had little flashes of that last season, but it's it's clicked more so for me this year. The shot. I, I, I think it's kind of wait and see, but I really like how he plays in the flow. And I like how all of these guys play in the flow. You mentioned Zaire Williams. Keon Johnson's had some really good flashes. They're just throwing guys into the mix there, and they do have a lot of length. I will say, as far as like whether they're going to be a potential defensive jug or not, very wispy length. You know, the kind of length that if you if you <laughs> exhale too hard, it could it could blow Nick Claxton over potentially. Right. Uh, that that can work to a point, but is going to be a little bit uh, more difficult to manage against certain kinds of competition. I, I'm I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed by the level of competition. I'm very impressed by the depth here, which I think is just flat out better than I expected it to be. And like you have to give your flowers to someone like Cam Thomas, who has just been like one of the best crunch time scorers in the league this, yeah, at this point right. in the young season. Like he is a guy Delano who's always Fayton, been crafty. Cam Thomas. <laughs> these Curry. are the two. Yeah. The, yeah. These, these are our lords, you He's know? He's averaging three assists a game, which is, you know, equal to, years to, to, to Cam. Year. It's, it's <laughs> equal to Cam Johnson, but like way more than I would have expected. And I, I just love the fact that Rob... You know, he described the Nets roster as like a bunch of guys in the form of that floppy, those floppy air things yes. that you put in front of used car dealerships. That's the vibe. Um, but meant it as a compliment. I love Wacky that. Kind of. Two men. Yeah. It's the, it's the kind of compliment <laughs> that gets you to four and four, but maybe not to eight and eight. You know, I think, I, I think we're expecting some regression from them. I think it's good for them because what you totally. want to do is showcase some of those three and D older three and D wings. They have yeah. like many generations of them on this roster. It's like, hey, you interested in Dorian Finney Smith? Oh, he's playing pretty yeah. well. I don't know if you've yeah. seen this game against the Net the Grizzlies the other day. It's pretty good. <laughs> um, so I, I think it behooves them. I, I do think they might need to trade some guys because I also think if you want to be thick in the tank race, I think you need to be on like the Jazz level. Uh, and right now they're like three games up on what the Jazz are doing. Yeah. And so they're, uh, they're going to get there. They're yeah, going to get there. Not worried, worried about that, honestly. <laughs> not uh, at all but you know worried. what? We said that about the Jazz a couple of years ago when they started stacking That's early fair. wins, right? Yeah. And we're like, fair. oh, well, they need to lose more. And it took them too That's long fair. to tank. So that got to tank they, early. They probably should. And I think Sean Marks is smart enough because 
unlike the Jazz, they don't own, like, every single thing going forward. But, like, shoot, like, I think Sean Marks is smart enough to know, like, it'll be time to pull the trigger and they'll get something good for, you know, whether it be Finney Smith or Cam Johnson or Schroeder or any of these guys. I, I take all of these points. Uh, Cam Thomas is not Lowry Markkinen. You know, like, that's that's not what's happening here. You didn't think Lowry Markkinen was Lowry Markkinen. And I, I, mean, I say not just I, you. I think every single human yeah, who yeah. watches basketball. That's fair. That's And Cam Tom, like Cam has legitimately been better than I thought. And I want to say this about the assist thing, because we do bag on Cam for taking lots of shots. I, Me personally, I'm never going to love Cam Thomas shooting 20 times a game. It's just like not for me. And I am learning to accept <laughs> that about myself. And I'm also learning to accept who he is, because like I, I genuinely do not think he is a selfish player. He's just one of these guys who is wired to think and see the game in a particular way. And it is basket first. And I, honestly, for this team, they need some of that. Like, they they need someone who's going to force shots because Dorian Finney-Smith isn't going to do that, right? Like, Nick Claxton is not going to do that. You need some guys who are willing to force the issue. I want to give all due credit to him for doing that in a way that I think has been actually pretty healthy for them so far. So you're saying it's not premeditated selfishness. It's just like natural. He doesn't know what he's doing. Selfishness. Some people are just oblivious to the world around them. And okay. is that selfish or is that oblivious? Well, that's a good segue to the Los Angeles Lakers, uh, the next team on our docket. We're launching this conversation because Anthony Davis is leading the NBA in scoring 32.6 per game. Uh, this is better than I ever thought AD can get to. Like, I thought his days of being an MVP candidate were gone. They might still be if the Lakers keep playing the way they are. But like, the Lakers are kind of fascinating here for a lot of reasons. Uh, he didn't play last night against the Grizzlies, a game in which the Grizzlies take very seriously, including John Morant, who I guess, uh, you know, scrubbed his image, but now has to is just like outright just kind of punking LeBron on the court and kind of being a dick. But that's fine. That's a whole other story. I think people um, like that version of Ja, to be honest with you. I think that's it's a more that's honest the version, version they want. Yeah, that's the more honest version. I'm actually kind of glad for it. But like them, Nike trying to package him as something else is just like, give me a fucking break. Anyway, uh was the Lakers <laughs> take this anywhere you want you want to talk about Anthony Davis's scoring I'm, or the I'm fact buying, that they can't defend I'm, anyone without him I'm buying AD as a scorer but um hello and I said this a thousand times sorry Laker fans Darvin Ham was not the problem okay well, the he, problem, was a, he was a problem he was he was a problem for Lower the guys. A no huffing emoji, he just was a, a problem. problem. No, no, no. Oh, he he oh, was just no. No, okay. no okay. he was just a problem. Okay. He was he was a problem. He was yes. not the problem. I agree. Okay, and you know everybody kept calling Darvin him. He's a moron. He broke up this juggernaut of an of a lineup and blah blah blah. And why did he break it up? Because Austin Reeves and D'Lo were getting smoked to start the season on defense specifically. In the last four games, the defense has just been putrid. It's been horrible on the ball. And, and that's what Darvin Ham was dealing with when he was jerking guys' minutes around because he was trying to de de develop some form of a defensive identity. We get it. You guys found your scoring touch in the playoffs against teams like Memphis and Golden State, and that lineup was nice, but you still got to guard people. And, yeah, man, the defense is going to be a problem so long as you're starting D'Lo and Austin Reeves. Like, Austin Reeves isn't horrible, but when he's next to D'Lo, and those are your only options in terms of, you know, putting up resistance against high-level dribble penetration, you're going to have problems. And Ja Morant, I mean, goddamn, this is the dribble penetration nightmare of the NBA. And so it's no surprise that it was more mincemeat last night, man. Some ground lamb kebabs out there <laughs> last night were the Lakers. Uh, so, so, Rob, does Resistance 2.0 look a lot like Resistance 1.0? Is, is that what we're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Same as it ever was, Justin. You know, some things really do never change, uh, including the Lakers perimeter defense, which I, I agree. Is playing with zero force right now. Not that I expect D'Angelo Russell to play with a lot of force in that particular regard, but when AD isn't out there, like he wasn't against Oof. Memphis, there's just nothing to save these guys right now. And so I, I believe, to, to segment this out, on defense, you really need Anthony Davis out there to bail out a lot of the people on this team. Even, even your better rotation players really, really need his help in coverage behind them. On offense... I think the Lakers have a pretty hard time scoring without him too. Like they have a, they oh, have yeah. more options and more weapons, but 
JJ reorienting the offense to focus on AD to me was not just a good move and something that that like, that's the kind of thing Darvin Ham didn't really do. It was a matter of necessity. Like they have to play that way. And so if you're talking about him as a potential scoring leader, I think it has some some legs and some juice because what else are the Lakers to do? Like LeBron is one of the best facilitators in the league, but there are going to be matchups where the scoring is just kind of muted for him. And that's okay. Like that's that's who he is at this stage in his career. That's who he should be. Yeah. And, and I got- like Austin I like Austin Reeves as a second or third guy playing off of AD. So really who else are they going to turn to if not him? Yeah, I don't want to diminish what AD's doing because it has been pretty remarkable thus far. It's not only what AD had been in this Lakers version, the just like supremely athletic roller, like the best version of a center you can think of in the modern NBA without some of the frills that other guys pick up, like Giannis driving the ball or or guys who could stretch out there. He was just like so like streamlined and efficient in the way that uh, I think you could really appreciate this year. He's adding a little bit more without sacrificing that other stuff. He's getting to the line a ton, which frankly, the Lakers do a lot. And that's probably a problem the NBA should look at. But AD clearly is the type of guy who could who could draw those fouls. He's yeah. leading the league in that. Oh, yeah. Um, but also the stat from NBA University I saw the other day is that his floater is also becoming a major part of his game. 1.3 per game last year. That was 71st in the league. Uh, this year, 3.4 per game. That's fourth in the league. 66.7% he's shooting from the floor. And so like if he has that little in-between game, it's not like the, the mid-range jumper like he had in the Alvin Gentry Pelicans era, but he is doing something more in the middle. I think it is just gives him another weapon that's going to open up everything, not only for himself, but for everybody else in the Lakers. Because as we're talking about, they need it because these are a lot of offense first guys. And if they're not hitting, if Delo's going through that first half of the season stretch where he's just not shooting over his gourd, like this team does look pretty dire on both ends as opposed to just being dominant on offense and just bad on defense. I genuinely don't know where they would have been, like if not for Cam Reddish in that game against the Grizzlies, for example. Yep. Like some of their other role players have just been really flat, and there have been games where you look at their bench production and it's just not there. And so, w- I think they have a, a lot of players we like in theory, but a lot of them are streaky, a lot of them are flaky, a lot of them are on and off kinds of players who will wow you one night and be completely invisible the next. And that's where things like the free throw attempts for AD, I think, are really meaningful. Not just because I look, the Lakers do get a lot of calls. That is a real thing that happens in the NBA. I think it also represents him getting the ball and being aggressive and getting over the mental hurdle of yes. having to attack in this way. Something that I think has always been a bit of a battle for AD where he's wanted to be a certain kind of scorer, but as a big, it's a little difficult to do that. You you find yourself relying on either like those sorts of like longer mid-range jumpers or post-ups that can be a little clunky and don't always have the space. The floater that you're talking about, Justin, is a great, elegant solution to that. Like the, the one-legged kinds of runners he's been able to get off over other bigs, great. His willingness to go through and over and attack people and get to the free throw line that to me is what says this guy is kind of ready to be this sort of score and to, and to carry the kind of load that, frankly, the Lakers need him to carry. And w- when you know you're being featured, um, it allows you to take a more holistic approach to your attacking, where it's like, okay, I did that, the defense did this, I'm going to do this, and then, it, like, he can throw out a bunch of different things because he's getting all the opportunities to best optimize what he wants to do when it's like, all right, I'm only getting but so many attempts and they're going to be one kind of attempt all the time. Like, you know, you're not as dangerous. And and I love that. I think, you know, some of the problems and I'm looking at our, our little rundown here and Max Christie, a guy whose stock I've been high on. Oh. Can, I, can I give you the stat? Yes. So uh, Bronny's on-court net rating is minus 26.2, and that's in 13 <laughs> minutes, right? So, <laughs> Leave him alone. Thing. Leave him alone. <laughs> that means if he played a quarter of basketball down 30 yeah. after a quarter. For 100 possessions. <laughs> yep. uh, a game Max, down 30. So that's minus 26.2. Max Christie is minus 24.2 in 128 minutes. I know it's early this season, small sample, yada, yada. 128 minutes, that's not a tiny sample. 
that's been really bad. And so, like, I actually think Rui Hachimura has been such a stabilizing force. Him not being out there last game means a lot at this point. Like, on both ends, yeah. it's like, I don't think he's going to give you pop. He's not going to be elite at one thing. He just fills a lot of gaps that this team needs because what they need is just stabilizers in order for AD to be brilliant, for LeBron to chip in when he's able to and be that, like, just dominant force and spades. And so, like, it, it gets pretty dire pretty quickly. Just repeat that sentence that Rui Hachimura has been a stabilizing force. He's a stabilizing force. presence. He's taking it's, a leap this true. season. He's taken yeah. a leap this season. That's, One could say. One yeah, could say a, that. That's a crap narrative, Justin. I don't know where you're getting that <laughs> narrative from. I, I think they're a prime candidate for a trade. I, I kind of think about them like I did in preseason. It was nice to see them pop to begin with, I do think JJ has a noticeable effect on the offense. They just, they play hard on offense. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I remember in that Cavs game, they were just running through in a way that you typically don't see from most NBA teams at this point in the season. Um, I just think they need something else. Otherwise I think they're going to revert back to who they should call the Nets. They should call call the Nets Nets. up. They have missed Dennis Schroeder since the day that they traded him or let him go or whatever. They missed Dennis Schroeder. They did bring him back, didn't they? Am I, am I misremembering that? They did bring him back for a spade, yes, and then they let him go again. I mean, so it goes, you know? Yeah. Life, life in cycles. But, but if you really love it, if you really love each other, he will come back to you, Los Angeles Lakers, I promise, in, in time. You hope. Um, all right, let's go to the next team on the docket, the Houston Rockets. Uh, believe it or not, the Houston Rockets are a top four team in the Western Conference. Right now, five and three. Plus seven point differential. That's third in the West, fifth in the NBA. Rob, I think I believe. I think I'm ready to love again with the Houston Rockets. That's so funny because believe it or not, Justin Ferrier said the Spurs were going to be better than this team in our preseason power <laughs> rankings. Uh, I don't think that's going to end up being true, unfortunately. They I don't waxed think so either. them last night. Oh, they absolutely wax them. It's also kind of insane. They've already played each other three times so far yeah. this season. I don't know what's Get going on with way. that. Get it out the way, but uh, I, I, I would love to space that out a little bit. And I think it does maybe distort some of this slightly, right? The, the Rockets are clearly better than teams like the Spurs. That said, I am like perilously close to believing this. I am. Yeah. If, mm. if you want to move the line slightly and say the Rockets as a, as a playoff team, as a top six team, I, I think I might be ready to believe that, at least in that idea. Four seems maybe a bit ambitious, even yeah. if we account for some Golden State regression, even if we account for, you know, teams like Minnesota or Dallas, like ticking up over the course of the year, Denver ticking up as they already have kind of proven themselves to despite their injuries so far. Uh, other teams will get better. I just think that the bones here for Houston have been really promising. And the, the larger concerns we had about making all the pieces fit, there's some evidence of that in, in the vein of like Reed Shepard just not playing very much. I also just haven't seen a lot of evidence that Reed Shepard is ready to contribute at a super high NBA level just yet. He gets picked on every second he's on the floor. I think defensively, he's kind of uh, in his own category relative to a team that is really stout on that end. And if anything, my my optimism has been buoyed by... I, look, I'm not struck by how many Rockets lineups I love with Amen Thompson and Tari Eason on the floor. I They're am so struck good. by... Ime Udoka also seeming to love those lineups mm-hmm. and playing them a ton. Like that is almost the defining look for them right now is Jalen Green, those two guys, Fred Van Vliet, and whichever big makes more sense for the matchup. That's a tough group, and they are defending the hell out of people. Yeah, I, I love that Ime has taken on the challenge of building a, a stout defense around Shangoon. Because I think that was the major knock on Shangoon's game. It's like, how do you heavily invest in a center? that you're constantly going to have to make adjustments for to to field competent defense. And Ime just leaning in the idea to like, yo, I got mega athletes on my team. These guys can detonate at any freaking time. And that's how I supplement, you know, my big man's deficiencies. And it's working. Like, I was... I was kind of suspect that they could put together a stout defense. A, like, a good offense, I thought they could have the base for that. Like, there's enough talent... On here, and Shangun is such an operator on offense um, that I'm like, all right, they could put a good offense around what this guy does. But defensively, eh, I don't know. But the fact that they've just been like, you know what, man, let's just play to our strengths in terms of the youth and the high motor and energy level. And now he's getting these guys to have attention to detail and execution. You know, hats off to Ime for that. That's big. 
Yeah, and they've been able to strike a balance in a way without necessarily changing anything about them. Like they were a defense first team with a bad offense last year. Right now they're fourth on defense, seventh on offense. And if anything, they've been able to blend those two together without even relying on the crutch of Fred Van Vliet, who happened to be like the caretaker last year. Like maybe he wasn't their best player last year, but he was their most important. And if anything, he has been largely a, a pretty big negative for the team this year. He played really well against the Spurs last night, 21, 10, 7, and 2. It was great to see, but you could definitely see this team moving past needing him where it's like, I think Rob is right. I think the team is a lot of young, fast, just like switchable defenders, a men in particular, Tari Eason in particular, but also filters down to like Jabari and all those guys. Um, and so I think not only are they good right now, they have the potential to be even better, not only because of internal growth with some of these guys, yeah. but also like, I think you could trade Fred almost immediately and probably not feel anything. I think like we talked about the, the Rockets, the potential maybe aggregating some of these guys in order to get like a Kevin Durant or a star in there. I think there's also a kind of a middle tier option where they stay who they are and then add somebody else with the Fred contract plus picks. And so they have a lot going on for them right now. Yeah, this is where I get a little bit nervous because I do think the sort of training wheels on the offense that Fred provides sometimes is genuinely helpful yeah. for them. Like, no. Jalen Green, I think, has largely been pretty sensational. I've been really impressed with his shot making and his creation. That's right, Rob. Oh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm back on board. He's, he's, he's been terrific. Uh, but there are times where it's like, how comfortable would I feel if this guy was creating everything? How comfortable would I feel if, you know, like <laughs> no, 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 no. either, because if you're going to trade Fred, something's got to give a little bit. Either you're playing Jalen at point with more wings, you're giving the ball to Amen Thompson more. Who, he's not ready for that responsibility. He's basically more of a big right now than he is a, a traditional guard, or you're dramatically upping Reed Shepard's minutes. And so I would want to slow play it a little bit. Like, let's let Reed get ready and up to NBA snuff. Once we feel like that is comfortable, then, then it's time to trade Fred because, I, yeah, he, he, the shooting hasn't been there. He hasn't played all that well. Uh, again, short of that Spurs game, which he like could not miss a fucking shot. Uh, but the the security blanket of having a guy out there who, even though he hasn't been shooting well, teams do guard means something. Having a guy who makes generally pretty good decisions means something. Who's going to compete defensively means something. It's like he's the sort of balanced option who isn't fatally flawed in some way that makes me feel more comfortable having him out there, even if he's not playing great. So Jalen Green right now, in terms of ownership of the offense, reminds me of like, you know, I don't have any kids, but like when I go to my friend's crib and like the the toddler is like, oh, they're eating the SpaghettiOs with the spoon by themselves. Wow, that's impressive. Like <laughs> they can just feed themselves. And then you turn around for 25 seconds and there's just red sauce all over the kid's entire clothes. Like yeah. that's how I feel about Jalen Green. It's like, yeah, he could... He can put some, do some spoons and hold it by himself for a little bit, but you can't just, you know, plop him in front of the TV and expect that everything is going to go perfectly, right? Like, you definitely need Fred Van Vliet for those times where, all right, you know what? Jalen Green is cooking. Fred can easily slide off the ball, and he his range goes so far. Like, the spacing yeah. is just going to be beautiful, right? And Jalen Green is taking half of his attempts from three, Making them at thirty eight point eight percent. That's who that uh, the, we're getting to where we need we'll to take be. That he, he's we putting just, his pants on by himself. Yeah, he's doing a lot yes, of things out there. He is. He's even picking out the socks that he wants to wear. <sighs> Same you know, but, kind. Yeah, I, but, I have trouble with that. To be honest with you, you know, it's it's complicated. <laughs> it's high level. But he's not getting to the line yet in the, in the consistent manner that we would need from a superstar. But like, listen. The fact that he's getting the attempts up and it's accurate and defenses now have to respect that, that's how you get to the road of, you know, making your drives even more efficient. Um, again, I don't, I still don't think that he's where he needs to be, obviously, on a playmaking tip, right? But he's getting there and he needs the reps. But yeah, Van Vliet definitely, you know, he's like the safety on a gun. You know what I'm saying? Like, you still need that there, you know? We're getting toddlers and guns in the same conversation. I'm getting very nervous. Uh, this is what America's about now. Well, Listen. yeah, it's very true. Uh, and I think Dylan Brooks is part of that conversation too, right? There are matchups where Hell he's yeah. pretty essential. And in particular, if you want him like bodying bigs as, as a wing and you want to play a slightly different style, he's really important. There's obviously also games where he goes completely off the handle. And I think what we're seeing is the, the shift in who the essential personnel for the Houston Rockets is. Yep. And increasingly... 
Amen Thompson and Tari Eason are, are in that category. And I, I just think that their best, most exciting basketball comes with those guys on the floor. I think the days of Tari Eason playing 15 minutes, we got to throw him out. Like he's got to be in at least the 20 to 25 minute range. And if anything, the stress point, in addition to how much do you need Fred and how much do you need Dylan Brooks? How are these bigs going to feel about this situation overall this season? Like how, how is Shangun going to feel by February when he's still not finishing a lot of games? And Jabari, the same thing. Like, there's going to be matchups for each of those guys. There's going to be matchups where they're just not useful. Like, Shangun has had games where he's just not productive enough to justify having him out there for the style that the Rockets are trying to play. That works great right now when everything is rolling, everything is working, everything about the Rockets makes sense. When things start to, you know, percolate, when the, when a couple losses start rolling in, I think the grumbling intensifies a little bit. And, and that's where I want to see kind of what are those guys comfortable with their roles being because... I'm sure they both envision being part of the future of this team in a really significant way. And we'll have to see if there's room for both of them to do that. Yeah, the Rockets are almost like shedding their skin in real time. And so we're watching them almost carve out who are the essential players while winning games. It's like one of the most weird like combinations of like timelines happening simultaneously. But it isn't at this point crossing over, but it might at some point. And I think Cam Whitmore, unfortunately, seems to be an odd guy out. So if we're trading people from this team, and if, if you want to go ahead, uh, Cam Whitmore seems like the odd guy out. And I just hope for his sake, like he could be playing for 15 teams in the NBA. We just talked about the Lakers. Like if the Lakers had that bench juice from him, like a, a athlete who could just get down the floor and just dunk over guys, like he would mean so much to them. The Rockets just have him in reserve and they can't find minutes for him because Eason and a men have been so good in that sort of type. So many guys, not too many guys, but there's well, so many guys. One, one too many guy at this point. You think so? I, if they can't play Cam, like, what are you going to do? I just think, like, too many guys is not really a problem when you're winning this many games, right? Too many wins right now. That's really the issue. <laughs> That's right. Um, last thing on the docket, the weirdest one I think we're going to talk about, and maybe one of the weirdest topics uh, that we've broached in, in a couple pods here, uh, the concept of an NBA closer... Uh, and so shouts to Tom Haberstro for not only pointing this out on the broadcast the other day, but also writing it up very quickly, I might add, just like the deadline skills on that guy. I still got that muscle memory. Uh, Rob, take note of those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so much, we all have different skill sets. Tom is just cranking that shit out. Uh, you know, that's not my strength. I, I want to, I'm more of a Shangoon at the end of the day. I want to be a little more methodical. I want to take my time. Let me cook. That's true. Uh, I am like a Delano <laughs> Banton, though, because I'm really coming on strong at the end. Uh, but I don't think anybody, not only me or the anybody in the NBA, can touch what Banton is doing right now. Scoring 48 points this season. All of them have come in the fourth quarter. And if you watch the Blazers game, they typically don't go to Banton until the fourth quarter because he isn't a regular part of the rotation. The Blazers, not a lot of top heavy, a lot of top talent, but they do, are pretty deep. And so their second wave is basically their recent first round picks. And so they're going to play through them. Banton gets whatever scraps are left. And so oftentimes they'll turn to Banton in games. It's happened with the Suns and it happened most prominently with the Pelicans game the other day. They just throw him out there because they're getting toward garbage time. See what can happen. He has been absolutely electric and has been one of the best closers in the NBA. So, Waz, what do you think not only about like what Bayon's doing, but the concept of saving a guy until the end like a baseball team, throwing him out there as a closer and order? I guess in this case, they wouldn't be preserving a win. It would be more flipping the late game situation and so they get back into the game. I think it makes absolute sense on the level of a team, I mean, a sport in which you have to play 82 games, that you would selectively sort of point a player at a problem and be like, you have X amount of minutes to execute, you know, whatever it is, whether it be guarding somebody full court, you know what I mean? Um, just guarding them 94 feet or attacking the offensive glass, right? Or, you know, whatever the case may be, like you assign somebody to a specific task and you tell them to go at it full throttle for their designated minutes. Like that sounds like a dream scenario in a lab. However, because these are human beings, like over the course of a season, 
Like, to tell me, like, I only get to play X amount of minutes and I have to extend myself to the fullest extent in those minutes um, doing a certain task. Like, human beings want to feel like they're a part of something, you know, in a bigger way and egos get involved. And that's why I don't know that you could deploy this, you know, in a more broad sense over a longer course of time. But the concept absolutely makes sense. And I've brought it up before with Jason Kidd's approach to the big man rotation in Dallas, where it's just like, listen, man, you can't get these seven foot dudes to play 36 minutes of, you know, planning guys on the screen, roll hard every time to the rim, make every single rotation, every single possession. Like, you can't ask any of these dudes that are seven feet to do this for 36 minutes. But shit, man, maybe I could do it for 24. Yeah. And I got two of them to do it with. So I think it's that sort of idea applied more, you know, in a micro sense. Yeah. I I, I mean, I think we all want to believe in this. And yes. I, I think what, I I think what, we, what I want to believe in is more creative use of the end of roster spot, end of roster spots whether that's a Delano Banton type, whether that's a particular sort of veteran that you bring in, like every team has their own philosophy. Often in the modern NBA, it's like who also is represented by the agent that our star players are represented by. Like who, how, who do we want to kind of glad hand here ends up being a lot of the transactional game. I get it. I understand why that happens. I love this sort of strategic balance of Delano Banton is out of the rotation, as you said. I think what what Tom points out, and rightly so about one of the quirks of this is like, the reason this hasn't happened before is most of these guys get elevated. Most of these guys get promoted. If you play this well, closing some games, like a coach will at least throw you some regular rotation minutes in the follow-up game. And now all of a sudden you're coming off the bench as part of like at least the second unit. That hasn't happened yet. I would think to the extent that this gets blown up, it's not because Delano Band will suddenly become a dramatically different player, but because, oh, now the, the Blazers are playing him more in the second and third quarter. Now he's now he's a part of what they're doing in a different way. Uh, but But the concept of, someone coming in and playing with a different level of energy. And this is kind of an extension extension of the depth conversation we've been having so many times in so many ways right now is like, how do you take advantage of that? How do you take advantage of the speed and energy that could come with a 12th guy in the rotation, a 13th guy in the rotation, whether he plays in, in the fourth quarter or not? And I think what works in, in Banton's favor is it, it's not that he's a slow player, like he has a burst to his game, but he is a knuckleballer. Like he's a mm -hmm. weird player to try to contend with. And so to have, <laughs> you know, the whole game played one way and then you think it's garbage time, but this like funky off speed creator comes in, I think it could mess all your shit up. And if you have that kind of guy on your roster and he's not playing regularly, let him shine, like let, let him cook, see what he can do. Not just in the sense of, oh, can we promote him into the regular rotation? But could this be a tactical advantage on the second night of a back-to-back -back for us? Not a coincidence that he has popped against teams that are mostly top heavy, the Suns in particular, but also the injury ravaged Pelicans who are just scraping by with like Brandon Boston minutes. I, I do think this goes hand in hand with a depth conversation where it's like the Blazers go very deep. And so those garbage minutes, you're playing against guys, not only who are supremely talented in like a Scoo Henderson or a Donovan Klingon or, or like even a Chris Murray, but guys who have motivation to play as hard as possible in those yes. minutes. And you're seeing the balance strike there where it's like, you can't really take time off. It is to, to Waz's point about the centers. We're just doing that across lineups at this point. And so the end of games are starting to matter more. And I hearken back to what we were talking about with Kirk the other day in terms of um, the Thunders rotation and their depth and how they deploy it and how they tend to use different lineup combinations in part to throw off the opponent. Well, not playing Banton for so long and not knowing if he's going to come out, then all of a sudden getting this different player out of nowhere, like it is jarring and you have to adjust to it. And you're at the game when guys are tired. And also like, you're just expecting to coast toward the end. It seems like I would have to really look into this, but it seems like we're not coasting as much. And if anything, the game is getting harder. I know we talked about physicality being meted out of late, but more recently, the points of emphasis changed to put more physicality in there. Like the second half of seasons are compressed in a way that typically they haven't been in recent years. The pace is up. And so there's just much more wear and tear on the body. So it's not surprising to see guys lose juice in games if you are a eight deep team and teams that are 12 deep all of a sudden come back and just storm into the game and Bannon's just kind of a, an example of that.
I agree. I just, to Waz's point about the ego element of this, I don't think this is a job in the NBA. For sure. Yeah. And it's, it's an incredible find by Tom and like a, a genuinely arresting thing to watch in this early <laughs> season. Like watching Delano Band do this has been exciting in a way that I did not think Portland Trailblazers basketball could be exciting. Uh, I'm very glad this is happening. I'm very glad that he pointed it out. I just, I think, I see it almost more of like a special teams thing, Waz, where it's like, this is the thing you assign your like young receiver or cornerback to do. And then at a certain point, un unless you're like the best at to literally ever live, you're going to kind of graduate out of it. So I think this is also an addendum or I don't know, an aversion. I don't know the word to use um, on the concept of the traditional six man, right? It's like Jamal Crawford, like, it's not that you're not a good scorer and can't play on um, the starting lineup, but you're not good enough to be featured here. Yes. But against these bums, oh, yeah, we could feature you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, <laughs> when, when, when we're when the, when, the, when, the, when the bums come in on the second unit of the other team, yeah, you're absolutely able to be featured. And so because the league, like, second units are just so, like, to me, that's the biggest difference between now and 15 years ago is the second units of teams. It's just way freaking better. Like, I don't think that Shea Gilgis Alexander is way better than what T-Mac was in his prime. I don't believe that. But, like, the guys that played on T-Mac's bench. Oh, yeah. Compared to who's on the Thunder's bench. Compared to who's on even Indiana's bench. Like, bruh. Like, it's just way better. And so maybe, yeah, the advantage is... Getting guys while they're tired. Not that they're bad, but they're lesser versions of themselves. And we now get to deploy, you know, somebody who's being the best version of themselves because their motor can be deployed at, you know, a way higher level. Like, I, I, I fuck with that, actually. Damn, shots fired at Boki Nakbar today. Just, you know, <laughs> sitting on his couch somewhere, taking a straight, just felt like a twinge what? in the universe. Mac had a great bench <laughs> in Houston. Are you shitting me? I was uh, a Daryl Morey fine. There we go. I also wonder, though, if this advantage that we're all talking about with being deep compounds over time, too. Because let's take a top-heavy team like the Suns, for example. Like, if you're throwing KD back out there to play 10 hard minutes at the end of the game because the reserves threw it away, like, what if that keeps happening month over month over month? Like, if anything, the torque on those guys it's is going good. to compound. It's not going to lessen. And so, to harken back to our original conversation about the Warriors' depth and what that means long-term versus a team that's more star-studded, I do wonder like yeah i think if the thunder are playing eight guys and those eight are just lock solid that's going to matter more but if your eight are playing hard minutes throughout an entire regular season if you're the sixers a team that tends to be injured and is injured again in new and exciting ways as we record this podcast because tyree maxi is going to be out like is that just going to be more of an issue as the season trudges along as opposed to less because i think a lot of times teams were building in order to get to the playoffs that was already hard, and you see teams build depth as a result of this. Something like this adds to that problem, and it actually makes it almost impossible to be top heavy in a way that, like, maybe not the Sixers are, but like, you know, certain other teams out there. Like, maybe the big three model, for example, just can't exist anymore if we're going to be this deep with players who are not only good, but play hard. I think it also staves off the sort of like erosion of trust. I think part of the problem when you are a Joel Embiid, for example, historically, is every time you sub out of the game, your team bleeds points. And what, what that does in terms of how you think about your teammates, like who you're willing to pass to, how you feel about the overall ecosystem of the team, you're just going to be more confident of it if you don't have to keep coming in with five minutes left because like your guys couldn't finish out the fourth quarter without you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're going to have a big three, they better be extremely complimentary. They cannot have any redundancies because if they're complementary, that means you're covering all of your bases. You know, you don't have, you know, duplicative strengths um, anywhere. And so, like, you know, the team is more well-rounded and whole. But if it's just like, yeah, we're just piling talent, like, I don't know, like Brad Beal and, um, <laughs> and Devin Booker. Like, the, I don't know. Nugs? Like, you know, Russell Westbrook is very important to the Nuggets team right now because he has the same effect for them. 
Like he yeah. wants to fucking rip it every time he's on yeah. the court. And you see what that energy does to a top heavy team that absolutely needs that at this point, if yes. only to buy time for their younger guys to get the reps and, in order and to the be young guys, the players. young guys are definitely being invigorated by what Russ does. They, they want to oh. run with him. They want to play high pace. Like it helps the young guys. I don't know that it's helping Jokic that much, but it's helping the young guys for sure. <laughs> Obligatory Peyton Watson shout out game saving block. Let's Woo! fucking go. After We're breaking a free throw or two, but hey. We got to take the bad with the good. Completely. The universe leveled itself out, you know, <laughs> ultimately still still in the net positive for Peyton Watson. Well, I was going to say that this big three doesn't need depth because we could plow through. But Waz, you did take the podcast off <laughs> earlier this week. So, oh, so I, I want to give you a shout. Seem, matter of fact, you seem more fresh. Shout out to, to, yes, big shout out to uh, Francesca. And Joseph, who got married. I thought you were going to give a shout out to Kirk, but no, sure, also, also your friends who got Fra married. Oh, Francesca's my friend since I'm 14, freshman year of high school. So to see her get married was beautiful. And yeah, shouts to Kirk's Goldberry, um, Goldsberry, new teammate, um, and filling in, stepping up when needed, man. That's, that's what it's about. We go at least four deep on this podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we make it past December. Uh, but tune in for that. All right. We'll be back on Monday. As per usual, we hope. Uh, thank you to Isaiah Blakely. Thank you to Ben Cruz. We'll talk to you then. 